Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another week at Beyond the Trailer Park. And uh, joining us as usual, and I think on a more stable connection this week from the wilds of Pennsylvania, is Beth. Howdy, folks, and I hope it is stable. <laughs> well, you sound a hell of a lot better than last week, so this is good. <laughs> oh, last, last week was fucking terrible. Uh, and Tracy missed all the fun, but uh, she's oh. coming to us from from uh, sunny Maine. Good evening. It actually was sunny today. Yes. Hey, good guess. All right. <laughs> I'm I'm clairvoyant. <laughs> Quick, call Do James Randall. <laughs> Do I need to add you to my list? No. <laughs> And coming to us from a, a pub, which is a first for us, which is awesome. Uh, somewhere in the wilds of Ontario is our guest this evening, Greta Vosper. Good evening, Greta. Good evening. Great to be here. I'm in Kingston, actually. You are in Kingston. I was going to say, I thought that's where you said you were going to be. So yeah. she's she's still a few hours away from me. Normally, she's just down the road from me in Toronto. So. Good to have you. So I know your time is limited tonight, so we're just going to kind of jump into things. And we, the three of us can spend time convincing about stuff later. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting you at the uh, Imaginary Religion Conference, which was uh, a great experience all around. And so... The most interesting thing that people hear about you is that you are a practicing United Church of Canada minister who is openly atheist, which I think is pretty amazing. Uh, so first of all, what I would like is because uh, a bulk of my audience is actually American and the ladies here are Americans, they probably don't know what the United Church of Canada is. So let's start right. with that. Right. And I was raised in the United Church of Canada, so I'm all I'm I'm yeah. quite familiar. Okay, the United Church of Canada uh, was formed in 1925 when three denominations uh, decided that it was ridiculous for them to all be sort of selling the same uh, formula of theology to Canadians. So they joined together, and that's the all the Methodists and all the Congregationalists, which is actually a bit of a dissenting group from the Anglicans and most of the Presbyterians. And they came together in 1925. That was a time in church history when the social gospel movement was pretty huge. And coming out of the late 19th century and, uh, you know, the Christian and the, all the Darwin uh, implications for theology and religion, uh, Albert Schweitzer's uh, explorations into that quest for the historical Jesus in which he really just said anybody who starts looking for Jesus always ends up finding a guy that looks just like him. Um, and so all of that was really having a very significant impact on Protestant Christianity. So uh, when the United Church came together, that's a hog outside, obviously. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, that's okay. So, <laughs> Anyway, so so when they came together, um, the social gospel, which was really looking at the disparity uh, that was growing because of the Industrial Revolution. So so people there were the wealthy, wealthy uh, were um, coalescing as a group. And then there was extreme poverty. And so uh, the idea of the kingdom of God uh, began to be understood as something that we could bring about here in the world. And so that's why it's called the social gospel, that that the gospel was wasn't about saving yourself in another life. It was about saving this world corporately, not just individually, but the entire world. And so manifesting the kingdom of God on earth. So that's what the history of the United Church is. Um, and over the course of its history, it has been on the forefront of a number of um, justice issues. Uh, yes. Gender justice um, early on when women were, were ordained in the 1930s in the United Church of Canada, uh, then um, arguing that divorced clergy didn't need to leave the pulpit uh, in the early 60s. Uh, married women could be ordained. Um, we started talking about a woman's right to choose in the early 1970s, uh, which led to conversations around sexuality. In, the in 1988, we began ordaining, uh, uh, practicing uh, gays and lesbians and uh, have continued to, to 
you know, move forward yeah. on a number of issues, right? So you, you so, had said yeah. uh, you called it like probably the most progressive church in the entire world. And I, I agree. I would, I would say so. Yeah. Raised yeah, in absolutely. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so along the way, yeah, go ahead. yeah, one of the challenges along the way is that as it was teaching a very progressive theology, it neglected to make space for the people that it was teaching beyond belief. So uh, in theological college, I was taught that Jesus was a historical figure, uh, not that he was God. Um, I was taught that God was a concept that you wrestled with. I was taught that the Bible was written by human people um, uh, who were in human contexts and had human shortcomings. So, so it was very, you know, I was all that up academically. It was fascinating stuff. Um, and it made it even more important that I um, live in a way that brought about the kinds of things that would create a better world. Um, and that's the leadership that I took on as I became a minister in the United Church. So there's the history yeah. in the background. Awesome. So I, I got delved into your book i didn't get a chance to finish it unfortunately i was a bit under the weather last week but i've been i've been watching a number of your interviews and i gotta say your your take on um how to as you like to say irritate the church into the 21st century um it's really unique in in I mean, your journey yourself into realizing that you didn't really believe in a God as as it's being, um, you know, as you said, the supernatural daddy who fiddles with things, you know, and how to get the church to kind of move beyond that, I think is absolutely fascinating because your congregation, you don't even use Bibles anymore. And I think a lot of people, because a lot of people are thinking, well, how the hell can you be a, a minister in, and an atheist at the same time? Like that just doesn't work. But how you've done that, I think is, is really fascinating and unique. And you've, brought them um as you said sort of beyond belief and even though i'm sure there are people in your congregation that do believe in some kind of you know supreme being but um i i just find that so fascinating so what sort of like i i've seen in some of your your interviews but maybe you can articulate a little bit why would you want to stay there if you've realized that you don't believe in the supreme being sky daddy yeah and and as i say it wasn't really that i had this concept of this supernatural god um right. i i in my book i have a chapter called severing the corpus callosum which is that piece in the middle of your brain and and when i went to theological college it was it was years after theological college that i realized that the whole sort of creative side of my brain which was you know, learning how to create meaningful symbolic experiences for people that, you know, riveted them to um, a life of compassion and justice, you know, convicted them and edified them, you know, and whatever it was I was doing, that that part of my brain was totally separate from the part of my brain that said none of the language I was using was true, right? So I yeah. was creating all these things, but still using the language of traditional Christianity, because that's those that's the tool I was given to use. And it was mm -hmm. it was uh, sort of over the turn of the millennium that I realized that a lot of people in my congregation didn't realize that when I used the word God, I wasn't talking about a supernatural God. I was talking about yeah. the relationship that we have, that we're compelled to create with one another and how we should try to make that relationship rich and life giving, right? So that it can have the power to, you know, give us strength when we need it. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. You pray to God for strength and stuff like that. Well, you know, you're really calling on that power that you have in all those positive relationships. So, so I really, I, and then a tragic situation happened with a colleague um, and, and the news headlines the next day, um, a family that had been in the same situation, but who had not experienced the same kind of tragedy had attributed it to God. And I went, whoa, like, I am not willing to play this game anymore. I'm not willing to allow that language to be justified by anything I say anymore. And I didn't know what the hell to do with that, but 
um, my brain one Sunday when I had no sermon to preach because I had had a busy week, um, came out with an I don't believe in God sermon. And I just totally deconstructed the idea of God. And, you know, and then I sat down and looked at my bulletin and I had to do the intercessory prayers and I had to say, oh, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And all that kind of was like very miserable, but... um, (laughs) Oh but, dear! But that was the beginning. I mean, I I called my board and I said, okay, um, we need to talk because you know, like they hadn't asked for a minister that wasn't going to use that language or do that kind of thing. And 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 we met, and they're intelligent people. And so when we had the conversation, they said, well, where is this going? Like, what would this look like if we decided we wanted to action? Because many of them had t- had studied a lot of books. They knew a lot of the language. Um, and I said, I've got the foggiest notion. And they said, okay, well, let's find <laughs> out. And so that's, I often say, like clergy yeah. don't believe are a dime a dozen, but congregations yeah. that will allow them to lead are very rare. And I feel extraordinarily privileged to be able to work in a congregation that will allow me to do this. Well, and what you had what said I, in your, your, go ahead, Beth. Yeah, go ahead, okay. Beth. What what strikes me about your your story is that um, you had mentioned church history, and your your whole situation would not float down here in the U.S. I don't know how familiar you are with the the religious right down here, but and one of the questions I have the church history up in Canada, specifically with the with your church. Do you think that they, like here in the U.S. during the 1850s and the 1920s, we had basically the spiritual awakening? Experience any of that, you know, within your church history? And you had mentioned... Oh, yeah, I I think that we did, too. And uh, there was quite a significant backlash against, um, you know, the the creep of science uh, into religion, right? And Mm -hmm. so the whole, like... um, you know, the miracle movement that started growing up at the end of the 19th century uh, and into the 20th century, where Protestant uh, denominations had, you know, the miracles had died with the apostles, right? But the miracle age seeped back in. It was only the Catholics that thought that any miracles happened. And so that seeped back in because it was like pushing back on this loss of the story, right? And I, I think that it is, it is true that Canada is a very different place than the States. However, Um, The United Church of Christ and the United Church of Canada have just joined together, right? They have just come to a, I can't remember what they call it, a full communion conversation or something. And I just spent a week in New York acting as a chaplain for the United Church of Christ denominational house at Chautauqua, uh, asked to be there by the United Church of Christ leadership um, there. So so there and there and there were lots of people that came and i had lots of great conversations with people who are in the situation where they too have read marcus borg and john shelby spong and Don, john dominic mm-hmm. crossan and and elaine pagels and and they know that this stuff is humanly constructed they know religion is a human construct but they're mm-hmm. caught in these religious communities that haven't given them permission to talk about that without using the language. Even the Unitarian congregations, many of them that I know, continue to use theistic language because they think that's the only way you can speak reverently. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, think, I think that there needs to be a transfer, and this is why I stay in the church, I think there needs to be a transfer of social capital from religion to the secular world. And I say that because religion, the off-label benefits of religion are crucial and important in this time. They're extremely important in this time, particularly given what's going on in the States. Because yeah. the off-label benefits yeah. of religion go to well-being, and well-being mm-hmm. goes to civic engagement. So if you have communities that are building well-being, that are working with individuals, creating relationships to the point that people flourish, they feel much more comfortable getting out into their neighborhoods, volunteering in their neighborhoods, Neighborhoods. They show up at the polls at a way percentage higher than those who feel isolated and are not connected. The secular world is, is, is represented poorly at the polls. People who are religious vote. People who are not religious don't. Well, what is that shit? That's got nothing to do with belief systems. 
That has to do with the fact that we are not in communities. So I think that liberal churches like the United Church of Christ, the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, which all have very progressive outlets, um, that they have a responsibility to transfer uh, their social capital, their leadership capital, and even their financial capital to communities that can create the kind of bonds that lead to well-being um, so that people have a community that they feel can empower them and strengthen them and get them outside of their houses, um, you know, out on the streets, making a difference, voting, um, caring for their neighbors, doing those kinds of things. That's why I stay in the church, because I think that's the church's responsibility. Well, and if you look at the, the roots of the traditional style of church, that's built on a kind of tribalist exclusionary way of thinking. And what you're trying to do is bring the church out to everyone and say, well, no, we're not going to just like people that go to our church. We want to like everybody and build a community together. Does that sound kind of what you're Yeah, and, and religion, you know, religion built itself up. It entwined itself like a vine around human needs, right? We created religion to cope with our needs. So now we can get rid of that vine and deal with our needs in other ways. And but we don't currently have the the institutions, the process, the um, engagement to do that. We're still we're still allowing religion to do that. And even the, even people who are engaged in um, all kinds of clubs or uh, community groups and things, they haven't. Those groups haven't had the spectrum of engagement around issues that religions often have and for good or for ill religion has has had a very powerful impact on the moral fabric of society um often for for ill right but i yeah. think that and, and my denomination has been has been proof that it can have that in a very positive way too we can we can create that and we can sustain it um but i think that you know liberal denominations have to you know pay the bills for the secular movement. I, I, I think yet, one but. of the things, one of the things I've noticed living where I live now, and I grew up in Buffalo, I've lived in Boston, and I've lived in El Paso, so is not foreign to me, but, but I live in a very rural hick town. And we have both Presbyterian and Episcopal churches here, and they're not liberal at all. I live in a base station of of republicanism, and it's funny because there's one church within you know within this area that basically dictates the religious leanings of all the different churches, and it's like they are so regressive. It, it's, it's the the openness that, that well, specifically your church has, you know, compared, especially up in Canada compared to here in the U.S. It's crazy. Yeah. So could you go and talk to the leaders of some of the, you know, Protestant churches that are not, that wouldn't consider themselves evangelical, like the United <laughs> Church of Christ and the United Methodist Church? and even the I Church would Church. probably get shot. Believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. she would. Right now, so that, right that, now, right now, yeah. the way things are going, I, I'm actually, and I don't say this for sympathy, I am afraid to leave my apartment. Yeah, because uh, I'm gay. I mean, I'm, an, I'm an atheist and I'm also gay. Yeah. Oh <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not very well liked. Yeah. Oh, we lost. Yeah, Tracy. which is which is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what and they're know, dealing and I with. Know, I know people that are dealing with way worse than what I do, and part of the yeah. and i've told this before part of the reason i do what i do with the, the show and my blog etc is because there was a young man on a, another french show uh living in texas he was gay he was black and he was an atheist and he was absolutely and he was terrified and i was like you know what screw that i stopped using my pseudonym and you know just went for it and that's what i like about the openness of, of what you're doing Mm -hmm. you're going i wish well, more, more churches i wish would do that down here there's some well that's and i mean the store my story uh story in that my denomination decided to create a ruling 
that requires that ministers be an ongoing affirmation of missions. Um, which yeah. when I answered the ordination questions, I never answered them literally. No one ever asked me to answer them literally. But now they have made a ruling that says that clergy need to be able to answer them literally throughout their ministry, um, which I'm fighting legally uh, because it is a, um, it's a shift in the direction of the United Church of Canada and one that I think is, is extremely unwise. In about 10 years ago, they decided that if they wanted to remain as a vibrant um, denomination, uh, they needed evangelical Protestants that were coming into the country. They needed to attract an immigrant population. And they believed erroneously that they needed to shift to a more con conservative theology in order to do that, which was, um, and, and it wasn't decided by the church itself. It was sort of orchestrated by uh, some of the leadership in the, the staff uh, at church house. So, um, so sadly, the end result of that is that uh, we take in um, almost as many clergy as we ordain from nations that have the names Pentecostal and um, Evangelical, and, you know, in their in their names of the denominations that are training retraining them theologically. So we do have a much more conservative theology uh, in the leadership of our church now than we did 20 years ago, 25 years ago when I was ordained. Yeah. So I, like I, I, I kind of got the impression even that they almost changed that rule because of you. You know, yeah, it's kind of it like, yeah. yeah, it's like we don't know what yeah. to do with Greta, so we're just going to yeah. kind of get rid of her somehow. And the well, rule and the didn't allow is, it. I was doing this mm -hmm. for 15 years before they even raised it. And I'd identified as an atheist for two years yeah. before they raised it. So yeah, there are some issues there around, you know, well, if it was okay for 15 years, why is it not okay now? Right. So, and those yeah. questions need to be answered. Um, and you Absolutely. can't just change the rules, you know, when somebody's scooping out ice cream and you say, okay, these are the sizes of the one scoops. And then suddenly they change it and make it half that and don't tell you i mean i can't fire you for right Greta, so. I, i'm wondering you said that it for 15 years it really wasn't an issue and then in the last few years it has become so one of the things i track is the influence of the religious reich um i call it exporting hate if you're familiar with the uganda situation and, mm -hmm, yeah. and the influence of the the uh uh Congress of Families in, in Russia specifically and also in the Ukraine. Do you think that our religious Reich, i.e. Peter Libera, um, seeing some of the church politics that you're facing? Um, I think Canada likes to think that it's separate and distinct from that, but we certainly are taking people into our denomination that come from those areas. The, the yeah. person who yeah. Past, who, who who made the motion to review me is from a congregation in Africa. Um, so uh -huh. I think that there's certainly influence there that has been um, unhelpful uh, and is unwelcome. I mean, I, I took the I took the label atheist in 2013, um, and I did that because of the situation in Bangladesh. Uh, as you know, I mean, back in 2013, there were four Bangladeshi authors that had been arrested and were called atheists. I didn't know it at the time that they didn't actually identify as atheists. They just identified as secular humanists, but they were given the label atheist in order to yeah. incite hatred against them. So, and they were being threatened with execution. Then Fazil Say, who was a Turkish pianist, at the same time was arrested and in, uh, sentenced to 10 months in prison for identifying as an atheist on Facebook. So my denomination had taught me that it was important at any that you feel that you need to be in solidarity with a group, you be in solidarity with them. So that the Anawim, mm. those uh, in Hebrew scripture, the, the little people are never alone, right? So I was taught to stand with those people. The fact that I also believed the same things that they believed, even though in my books I had called myself a non-theist and then I'd called myself a theological non-realist. Um, so I didn't believe in a supernatural intervention as God, and neither did they. So that was when I took the label on. And my denomination 
like I assume that would mind. I mean, it's a theological denomination. So I assume they would understand what the word atheist means in a theological context. And they did not. They understood that word to mean arrogant, religious hating, religious bashing, um, you know, like all of the bad accretions that the word atheist has, which has only proven to me that I should have used it 10 years before, right? Like if my denomination is going to use that kind of ridiculous um, understanding of what the word atheist means, then, you know, we're in very big trouble. So, so yeah. Well, yeah, I see it a lot in a lot of the quote debate groups I'm in and some of the iterations of what an atheist is, is really is mind blowing. So you had <laughs> mentioned true. really, mentioned yeah deb knows what i'm talking about we're in the same groups you had mentioned earlier earlier about um your like your understanding of of god would you call it the spinoza's god oh like yeah understanding I, I, or? I mean i would belong myself uh people from like hundreds of years ago um, when my first book came out, uh, when I was speaking about it in, in Vancouver, one of the theological professor, professors at the School of uh, Theology there um, said, well, really, I mean, it's just Farabach's um, theology. And I didn't even know who that was, right? I'd written my book and I didn't even know who he was. I talked about embarrassing, right? Anyway, so, and you think, shit, I thought that was an original idea, right? But no, like these, these, these have been embraced for hundreds of years. It's embarrassing yeah. that we are this stuck in these narratives. And the only reason yeah. we are stuck in them is because they privilege our own superiority. Yeah. Religion, the purpose of religion was to divide and keep safe. And it kept yes. safe by, right? And so we can't afford that in the 21st century we need to find ways to overcome that and the fact that it is getting worse is really an indication of the fear um, that that we have of the future and and contemporary society um, i mean i'm convinced of that so you know i want to undermine that as much as i can because i've often thought that um you know the, the the perceived rise that we're seeing in religiosity and um sort of that pervasiveness is actually because they sense that they're dying out and they sense that things are changing and this is sort of them you know trying to grasp onto whatever bit of legitimacy they can before they fade away would you say you see that or do you see it from a different perspective uh, Robbie Jones's book, The End of White Christian America, was really clear on that, um, that that demographic sees itself as under threat. Uh, the number of white Americans that sees themselves as um, discriminated against than blacks is something like 57%, and that even goes higher yeah. when, it's, when they're Christians. So um, in a world... <laughs> Uh, where people can actually believe that, um, that's a pretty frightening thing. But yeah, I think that's very significant factor that they see themselves under threat. And I and and it's fed by, um, you know, news media outlets like Fox News and by uh, the algorithms of Google, which, you know, feed us what it is we want to see and very rarely yeah. puts anything in front of us that we don't want to read. Uh, and I mean, when I went through theological college, it was read something that you know, you go yes, yes to every day and something that you want to throw against the wall. Like, that's what we were taught. You need to expose yourself to stuff that is going to get your hackles up and make you angry. And re not just expose yourself to it, but wrestle with it. Where the hell is this coming from? Right? Why are these people saying this? Why would someone write this down? You know, I, I need to understand that as a clergy person, yeah. right? And, or, I'm, yeah. or I'm only talking to myself, right? That's masturbation. Yeah. I talk about masturbation in the church all the time. Um, awesome. <laughs> you know, the, uh, spiritual but religious movement is often about masturbation. It's about spiritual masturbation, right? And, and that's a great analogy, though. I like it. Well, there is. I mean, the liturgical masturbation. There's all kinds of it, and and we, you know, like masturbation. It's not pretty to watch, right? But the person doing it feels pretty good, right? So, yeah. I think that we have we have created a world in which religion is. A mass, and that is not the church that I grew up in, and that is not to make people feel good about themselves. That that was antithetical to what uh, the work that I chose to do when I wanted to become ordained was. It was about 
comfortable uh, with where they were um, and trying to find, because if they were, if they were living comfortably, then there was somebody else that was paying for that. So how do we, how do we find out where that and, and write it? You know, that's the work we did. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, Tracy, do you look like you're going to say something or no? Uh, well, I, I was just thinking that um, what's particularly alarming about the number of white Christians who think that they are more persecuted than anybody is that they're simultaneously the most persecuted group in America and they control all the levers of power. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that seems like a... Yeah an incredibly dangerous combination where this group that has this false perception that they are persecuted controls all of the levers of power where they can further institutionalize uh, their privilege and their superiority. So even, even, if, even if that movement is, is dying, even if the demographic of, uh, you know, like younger younger Americans are more and more identifying as as nuns or as non-religious or as atheist. Um, but the institutions that are being fortified and built and the legal precedents and the, the, the courts and that whole infrastructure is being laid and that's going to last for generations potentially. So it just strikes me as an, a very dangerous set of circumstances. I would agree, and I think there's a there's a disconnect that isn't recognized by that constituency, and that is the disconnect between the haves and the have-nots. And many of the people in that constituency are not actually experiencing a poorer, uh, um, you know, like a poor economic reality uh, than they were before. It's actually pretty steady, if not even a little bit improved, but. Um, but they're they're wildly disconnected from the upper echelons uh, who are controlling these decisions. And um, but those people are encouraging them to believe that they're in the same constituency. Extremely rich who are making these decisions and it, continuing ensuring their own privilege uh, is maintained um, have the elements of that whole group of people because they see themselves as one to me all of the things that your president said before he was elected which appealed to that constituency he completely turned around and did the exact opposite as soon as he became elected and no there was no hue and cry from his voting base that he had failed you know betrayed them um so somehow he still gets them to believe that he's fighting for them in in a way so i i think that disconnect is not recognized um but i also yeah. think there are some things that happened yesterday in charlottesville uh that were noted by a friend of mine on facebook uh today um the fact that white supremacists now walk your streets without even worrying about hiding themselves um is is a very real reason for concern and uh, because it because they are they perceive that they have the power and the right to do that, mm -hmm. and that is not a situation that was even alive before the civil rights movement, right? So um, that they believe that they have the levers of power, that they have the power, take advantage of that, uh, is very disturbing. Um, and so, I I think that as some have have noted, um, who are who have been passive racists, and most of us are, and label and stop things. Uh, you know, we don't call people out when they say something that, that suggests a racist attitude. We, who are the greater um, portion of the population, I believe, unless we start calling that out, um, that very small, actively racist group will um, find themselves holding the levers of power and will create a very, very, very ugly streetscape. Well, I've even seen um, videos uh, uh, on social media where some racist 
asshole is is yelling at uh you know a, a person of color or someone they think is a muslim or whatever and there's i've heard them specifically say president trump is in power that means i can do this to you yeah yes yeah. well one of the things and i know and i think the even the i mean the daily stormer put out a statement after trump made his you know not wasn't a botched reaction he gave an honest reaction that's who he really is when he said you know both sides you know there, there was bad stuff on both sides and um you know all the nazis came out you know the daily fucking stormer is saying thank well, did you see this they actually said god bless him he's yeah, on our absolutely. side yeah. the, i mean the, the nazis are coming out and saying yep yeah, we heard you president trump we know you got our back thank you well but every david every, every, do go ahead Beth. Okay, every, okay, david do <laughs> yeah go ahead david do <laughs> David, David Duke actually came out and stated that we are we doing, doing uh, what you we elected you to do, and you are giving basically justifying our actions. And it's something I noted yesterday is that I said slowly people are beginning to realize why I focus on highlighting the so-called fringe because people are like, well, why do you follow Alex Jones and all these nut jobs? And I said the fringe, fringe isn't so fringe anymore when one can march down the street of America the decked out for war and wearing the yeah. uniform of their... I mean... Yeah, yeah. The khakis and the polo shirts, that is what Trump wears. That is his, quote, uniform. And they were wearing People MAGA hats and, and saying, Heil yeah. Trump. Yeah. 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 Well, and, Not, and, and, and what's funny is one of the uh, conservative commentators, and I can't remember who it was offhand, so I'm not going to name drop, but um, basically said, uh, uh, they were saying, you know, they were saying that, oh, this was a, a left-leaning, you know, uh, the reaction was, no, they weren't saying hail Pelosi. They were saying hail Trump. Yeah. I think that the other thing that's happening, too, um, and that we need to hold people to account, uh, particularly those of us who remain in the church, is the language of faith. Um is owned by the conservatives. I don't give a damn what your interpretation or what your definition of God is or what your, who you think Jesus was or what your definition of salvation is. Um, you can come up with some very liberal, you know, accommodating definition, but that word is owned by the conservatives. So if you as a liberal say, we need to listen to God's you know, what God has to say in this situation and God will not call us to violence. That is, that is bullshit because it will be used by the right, um, that God that you're talking about. And the yes. God in the hands yes. of the right is a very dangerous tool. You align religion mm -hmm. with the tools of war and you create a scenario in which, you know, Armageddon can literally be brought about because we now have the tools to do that. Well, and the worst part is if they're believing that, you know, Armageddon is a good thing, then we're all fucked because they, they want they want Jesus to come back. So they don't care if the rest of us get blown up, you know, because you know, they're going to heaven. So they think Yeah, well, I think I follow Trump has a theology like Trump doesn't have a theology no. around that. He, no. doesn't, he doesn't know anything. But he oh, will and, use no, he, he's not a dominion, dominionist or theocrat, but those that he's become a tool of the dominionist and theocratic oh. movement, yes. especially when you have a man like Mike Pence, who is his vice president, who is Absolutely. a known dominionist. And he basically came out in defense of Trump. Yes, he condemned the racism, etc., but he also came out in support that Trump did condemn it. Now, Trump has today come out and specifically named the KKK and the Nationalists and alt-right. But if you read the statements of all the talking heads within the political movement, their terms are very couched and basically it's a non-apology. And oh, yeah. Well, I mean, just a few things about his statement is um, 
even Richard Spencer said he didn't buy it. Richard Spencer. <laughs> well, Richard Spencer put a date or in, in his press conference said, I, I don't buy it. this. This is a totally insincere. Um, yeah. And Trump himself basically said, I was totally insincere. I was bullied into doing this, but, you know, because they said it would give me better press coverage and the press is still being mean to me. Um, well, and and then he, have... in basically the same yeah. breath, he said he was going to, he was going to uh, part, he wanted to pardon Sheriff Joe. And yeah. Sheriff yeah. Joe was He's one of the biggest of racial profiling. Yeah. He's one and of the biggest so, assholes out there. Yeah, so his statement it is it was clearly meant nothing. It took him 48 hours and the statement he gave up front was the one he meant. I mean, we we uh, we need to stop yeah. thinking that he he just made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. Well, he did he but, did he said what he meant the first time. Yeah. And just to add on to that is that what We'll say scuttlebutt. It hasn't really been confirmed, and I don't think there is any way to confirm it. But supposedly, Banyan and Miller wrote his initial statement. And for those that are not aware of Banyan and Miller, and I'm drawing a blank on the other two, oh, Gorka, Gorka, are known Nazi sympathizers. Gorka is actually allegedly, according to some reports, a member, a member of the Hungarian Nationalist Party. So it's like, you have three Nazis that are the lead advisors to the president. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but uh, I let's let's because we can sort of hash American yeah. politics too later because Greta's time's a little uh, shorter this evening. Although I mean, we could talk about it if she wants to, but um, I'm just you know I'm I'm fascinated sort of more by. I have her a story. question for yes. for Greta as. As the the mom in the group, and um, also a lifelong atheist, um, but I've thought about there's a uh, I don't know if it's the Unitarian Church um, in my you know the next town over that has a, you know they have the rainbow flag out front and they have a, a sign out front that said refugees welcome here and uh, you know this very open liberal. Um, but I just can't bring myself to going to a service that is going to have religious Theistic language. language and sort of indoctrinate my kid. If my daughter wants to go to church and learn, I'm happy to take her, but I don't want to be the one to make that decision for her. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on how how do you see that process evolving of, you know, you said something earlier and I'm, I'm probably going to misquote you, but about um, the church giving its, its uh, power to the secular community. So mm -hmm. yeah. how do you see that evolving? Exactly. And I think this is one of the pieces of work that needs to be done in the States particularly. And that is like with that Unitarian congregation, clearly their values are showing, right? They are welcoming of LGBT. LGBTQ people, refugees, they are clearly stating that they are wanting to be on the forefront of social, sexual, gender justice issues, right? So values are huge for them. So if the service there, and I would challenge you about letting your child explore that if she feels like it. There are lots of things that you would not let your child explore if she felt like them because you would feel that they would not be safe and, and healthy for her. And religion is one of those things. So I think parents really need to grapple with that. Um, but I think that you could go to that person who leads that community and say, you know what? I'm one of, I don't know how many moms in this community that raised my kid in a community that espouses the kind of values that I see here. But I don't want to have to use a language that is foreign to me and to my beliefs in order to encourage her to do that. So how can we work together to make that happen? There's an oasis community starting in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and it started in September. And I was just at the Oasis Summer in, Summit in Denver a couple of weeks ago. 
And the woman who's starting it was there. And she had started on Facebook, a Secular Moms in Birmingham Facebook group. And she had 500 members in that group in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. So if, if that's happening in Birmingham, there are moms all over the place that have kids. Raise them with the values that are being espoused by that kid. So how can you work to increase um, and create a welcoming space for those moms and those parents, right? Talk to that clergy person and say, how can I do this? Like be in touch with her and say, I'm, I'm so impressed with your values, but I can't take the language. Can you work with me to create a safe space for secular families, right? That's we'll use really your program. Good advice. We'll just take the language out of it. Yeah. That's really good advice. And I appreciate it because I, I think about, you know, uh, my, my husband and I do not agree politically. So like we can't watch the news uh, at home and there are, there are things that we try not to talk about, but my daughter's almost nine now. And I have to talk to her about things, current events and things that are going on in the world. She's going to hear about this stuff from peers for one thing, you know, um, and I want her to know the truth and what's really going on and help her to sort through it. So I have to start talking to her about this, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it would be so wonderful to be able to go someplace that shares those values and to have her, you know, to be able to sit for 45 minutes or an hour and listen to somebody talk about why social justice is important and why racism is bad and why political engagement is important and all of those things. That would be so good for her, especially right now she's at the stage where she would just soak that up like a sponge, but I, it has to be divorced from the religious language. So that's, I appreciate well, I that's really good advice. Yeah, I'll to that woman in Birmingham um, and, you know, you can connect with her and find out how she created this community um, on Facebook. And then, you know, and now she's creating an actual oasis community for people, you know, in Birmingham, which is about the last place in the world. You'd think that that yeah. kind of community can you, would go here, Can you right? say a little bit about what an oasis community, I mean, I, I think I can oh, sort sure. of intuit what it means, but I don't know if it's an official brand of something. Can you? Okay. Um, in uh, 2012, uh, Mike Aus in Houston had identified as an atheist uh, and resigned from his church. And the church itself was small and independent and it closed as a result. But within a few weeks, some of the members of that church were saying to Mike, we don't care about the beliefs. We don't care that you're an atheist. We need our community for weeks, a few months. And they created what they called Houston Oasis. About 18 months later, Helen uh, Austin in Kansas City, Atheist Church, found Mike. They connected. Mike shared with her the things that he'd done in Houston, and she launched in Kansas City in 2014. Um, and she launched with 225 people in the room, and they have about 200 people coming out every Sunday now. Since then, uh, an Oasis has launched in Austin. There's three or four of them in U. Utah, mostly with Exmoor. There's one about to launch in Sacramento. There's one in Birmingham. There's one in Boston. Uh, we launched one in Toronto uh, in, in February. West Hill is identified as an oasis. So there are secular communities that are created to, to transfer those off-label benefits to the secular community, the things that church has learned to do well. In the States, they seem to be doing uh, a lot there. It's a lot easier in the States actually, because most of the people there have a church background. They know how to do church. They know how to create potluck dinners and bring people together. <laughs> the, the one in Toronto, none of them have any church experience. They don't know what the hell is. So they're doing a pretty good job given that, but they recognize, you know, we don't know how to do this. We've never done it before. So. Um, so that's what an oasis is. If you if you Google um, or if you go, the website is peoplearemoreimportant.org. And that's one of their principles. People are more important than beliefs. So but how would you... Nicaragua building, building um, wheelchairs, putting wheelchairs together in Nicaragua for people in remote communities. Like it's doing all the kinds of things that church used to do, um, but doing with secular people. Oh, wow. Well, that's really how great. Would... How would you define that as different from, say, a Sunday assembly, per, let's say, or okay. is it well, very similar? Similar to Sunday assembly, except that 
The one thing that Oasis Communities, one of the things that it says is, is crucially important and that I absolutely agree with because of the re research that I've done on this is they meet on a weekly basis. Um, it's only when you meet on a weekly basis or even sometimes more than that, that you get to that place where you go from, you know, just getting by to actually flourishing. You create relationships that life and that allow you to engage differently. Okay. And that's, and so when we, we had launched a community on the other side of Toronto, uh, which met monthly. And the idea was we were going to launch another one the next year. Well, we couldn't because the leadership hadn't co -fake. You don't build community if you're only meeting once a month. So we went looking for a model that met weekly. And that was when we connected with the Oasis. Interesting. Because I know I like yeah. for me, even when I was really religious, I really didn't like church. I, I remember I used to uh, when I got old enough to realize that, hey, if you volunteer to lead junior congregation, it means you get to skip the rest of the service. I was like <laughs> all in. <laughs> I, I, I did that for as long as I could. But I even at my most religious, I never liked church. So for for me, I can see the appeal of the, the community. But I just kind of get that like church kind of and it's interesting vibe. because there are some people that get total hives like the, things will yeah. happen that oh my god that's true and they just you know like oh i can't do that but but they're and they're very they're much more cautious about that in the states than they are in toronto so they bring in speakers from the community that speak about a variety of different things um one of the uh, what stephanie baptist is a sex educator so she spoke at uh, Toronto Oasis. Her husband Rick Miller is a is a, a internationally known ac actor, and he talked about you know living out his, his values through his work on another occasion. Um, somebody was there talking about brain development, and you know they're talking today about truth. What is truth? Or this week, so they they bring in speakers and they bring in local artists. So each week you have a different local audition and you have a different speaker, and then there's some Q and A afterwards and a bunch of coffee. But, yeah, see, that doesn't yeah, sound so bad. that's what they do. So, yeah. So, there's, yeah. it follows a routine. So, people feel like that's one of the things that church does. When you go in, for is the second time you do. So, you feel like you belong. And that sense of belonging has this powerful, it puts things together inside us that, that we don't often find places that do that and do it well. Um, so the second time you go into an oasis and you know where the coffee is, you can tell somebody else to get there. You're you belong, right? And that's a very important piece of of well being. Yeah, the the community aspect I know is something a lot of um, people who have left religion have commented you know that i really miss that that i don't have that cohesiveness that knowledge that there's a, a community that that sort of has my back feeling and and they really miss that and it's oftentimes what keeps people from leaving a faith once they they've come to the conclusion like okay this is bullshit i don't believe any of this you know sort of fairy tale stuff but I don't want to leave this this sort of family that I have. So it, it's definitely, I mean, even I, who's, you know, kind of you church, I can see the value in that for a lot of people. But there's one also one of the points that is that is a very big concern for me is we're actually two or three generations away from the practice right we're two or three generations mm -hmm. in canada anyway away from coming together regularly opening ourselves up to you know whatever it is that somebody's going to say to us that may edify us and tell us that we've been doing things really really well or convict us and help us recognize you know we haven't been doing things as well as we should like those are the two big things that happen right so mm -hmm. um away from that practice practice so i don't know how to recapture that and if you look at if you go into any church in the united church of canada most anglican churches across the country the demographic is over 70 um almost yes. exclusively uh and they are there because they fell in together in the 1950s and the 1960s not because they believe Mo most of them don't believe most of them have never had a conversation about what they believe but they fell in love with being together. And I, I, I'm convinced 
that's why churches are still filled with those people um, because they they have had those relationships for 40 and 50 years. Well, even one of the, the members of our local um, atheist group, um, she's 74 and she was a lifelong atheist. And she said a, a few years ago, she found herself actually attending church with a friend of hers for almost a year because she wanted the the companionship in the community. And she said she yeah. finally had quit going because she said, I came out angry every week. So it wasn't mm, that's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. But that's, but that's the, that's the practice that we have. We've forgotten. And, uh, you know, the congregation that I serve um, has that same demographic challenge. We're younger than most other congregations and we're at, we always we're constantly bringing in people and people travel there's a couple who comes every year about three sundays in the summer and we always about their attendance but they actually live in scotland but but we have people wow. who travel from distance to be with us and and um we don't we're not a young congregation right we're not we we have some young people but we don't have any kids um we have two people who are there every sunday we pay them to be there every sunday in case kids show up but we don't have the resources to create a kids program we're building poor we wanted to sell our, our building to release the you know three and a half million dollars and the presbytery refused to let us do it you know they yeah. said well we'll give you three hundred thousand dollars I don't want that. We want to actually engage people. We want to, we, we're in a, an area of the community that, of the city that is, you know, very and racially diverse. Uh, it's one of the first places that immigrants come to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, all, um, and we're, we're strapped by these stupid property expenses. So we don't get to do the work that we could do if we wanted to, you know, we should be, we should have a yeah. kids choir going, you know, that brings in kids from the community. We should be doing X, Y, Z, right? We, we're out of practice of, of what's important. And, and it sounds like to the, the church proper that holding on to that tradition is more important than understanding the needs of the community. And that's, the funny thing about the about the United Church, uh, uh, just about a year and a half ago, we did a study with um, people in the congregation studying. We explored um, print materials and um, the United Church and our congregations, and we explored uh, what our uh, and compared them what our action, what our values were. What, what do we say is important to us? And what do we do? Like, what are the mm -hmm. actions that we actually engage in? And on the actions and on the values, West Hill and the United Church of Canada were completely aligned. Gifford was around beliefs. So this whole process of reviewing me and making clergy now having to, you know, hang on to these beliefs is so antithetical to the rest of the work that they do. And I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting when I talk, I'm starting to talk about the fallacy of the big tent um, because yeah. the United Church has seen itself as this big tent, which is great, um, you know, bringing more and more people into the tent and make, you know, being more and more broadly inclusive until part of that tent says, wait a minute, you guys don't belong, right? And so yeah. if the language is owned by the conservatives, it's pretty easy for them to say, wait a minute, you don't belong. So the people who started building the big tent suddenly find themselves outside of the tent. And that I, I, that's a story within religious traditions, but, I, but that could be a very serious story for our, well, right? And, yeah. um, and we are, you know, we, that's a very complicated conversation. Um, that we need to have. Absolutely. But I I liked, you know, your your reading the first part of your book where you talk about how you really wanted to stay and be that change from within the church. And like I said, your your Twitter quote, you know, irritating them into the 21st century. Yeah. And I I think, you know, it's I think it's such a, an important thing because if any anybody comes along and says, you know, hey, you know, church X, 
uh, we're secular and we think you should do X, Y, Z, they're going to see that as an attack from the outside and, and be like, oh, look at these secularists trying to tell us what to do and we're a church and don't they get that? And so having someone like yourself who is willing to step up and say, look, what what has been is not going to work going forward we need to do something different we need to change it and and that whole chapter about stacking up old paradigms because it's you yes. know it, it yeah. it's comforting well they're still there we can pull them out and look at them when we need them and mm -hmm. and that kind of attitude so uh, it, it's it's a refreshing way of looking at things i think I, well, I think that we have to, sorry, somebody wanted to ask something? Well, I was just going to say, and Deb knows this quite well, is I'm not the interfaith type person. <laughs> I find it quite, especially, you know, here in the States, quite annoying. But I think from the perspective you're coming at it from working within the church, you are bringing, I don't want to say a progressive view, but a very progressive sense of what needs to be done and you're not changing doctrine per se but you are you're changing the perspective how of how they how one looks at it and i find that a lot well, different and, and i don't mean to pick on matthew, matthew vines here but he's one i'm most familiar with where he's trying to change the church here in the u.s from within in regards to homosexuality but i think in a sense, what you're doing, and uh, and considering what's going on today, and you know, in our world today, I think it's important. You're you're adding a different perspective to it. Well, and I have a lot of colleagues who argue with me that I'm not really an atheist. I'm really a panentheist, or I'm really a something else, right? And because yeah. it's, it's important for them to hang on to that language, and they may believe exactly. the same thing that I believe, but they don't want to say that, right? Because that might put them outside the church. Um, and I, I think that the I think that the big um, challenge to the church now is to to make them accountable for the the fragmentation of society you know like they were yes. um a very powerful cohesive influence and and the yeah. liberal church the liberal church mitigated that argument between you know the radical libertarians and the radical religious fundamentalists and the, and the liberals kind of brought them together and, and stabilized society in a way and they've now abdicated that role so what's going on you have the crazy libertarians who are, you know, white supremacists. A lot of white supremacists are just libertarians taken to the nth degree and conservative fundamentalists. And they're trying to take over the whole moral social fabric. So where's the accountability for these institutions who had that responsibility and then just kind of said, well, you know, whatever, we want to do the circle jerk and do it in long robes with candles, you know, like, give me a break. Well, it, it, it's like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Josh Fierstein, and I don't mean to bring this topic back in, but it kind of highlights it. He put out a video today, and the basic gist of it is the KKK Christian. And I'm like, dude, read your fucking history. Yeah, it is. It's a, it was a, originally a Christian organization, and they're and they're trying to whitewash this whole thing. It's like, it's like you're saying they're trying to. But even it's, uh, even even my my husband um, had difficulty following that argument though, um, because yeah. the language of the far right is so. Uh -huh. You know, it's so contrived now that, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not really, it's not really about racism or it's not really about segregation. It's not really about, you know, that, right? Because they don't use that language. Exactly. Their, their um, terms are very couched and very absolutely. wisely chosen. And this goes back in, in, to who is the think tank behind it all and we yes, won't get into that exactly. but it, yeah. they choose the, just as pre President Trump's speech was very contrived those words were chosen very carefully and yeah. uh, you find Absolutely. it not just not just in this situation this weekend but in a lot of what they say and I think your approach to it is getting rid of all that window dressing and saying this is you know yeah yeah 
Yeah, yeah we have, and we just, have to do that. We have to, just to be clear. Yeah, absolutely. And just saying, look, you know, that's the language. That's what it is. You better own it or come up with something that's better because that's that's, that's just that's shit. And, and if you're you going to use that language, you need to be responsible for how else that's it is right. being used, that's, right? And that's, that's right. you know, I have I have the same. My son at one point said he wanted to. He was thinking of becoming a Muslim. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, don't think for a minute that you go off in that tangent without me bringing the same critique to that religion that I'm bringing to my own. Like, don't think that just because it's another faith tradition, I'm not going to go at it, right? So I said, I'll give you 30 days. Uh, it was, it was uh, Ramadan. So I gave him 30 days. And at the end of it, I said, so what are your reasons? Why do you want to become Muslim? And he said, well, I thought about it a long time and I figured that it was really just because it was countercultural. I said, not really a good enough reason. But but progressive Muslims are doing exactly the same thing as progressive Christians. Absolutely. They are oh, yeah. protecting the language, they're protecting the language of the radical right. And yeah. yes. by protecting that language, they are providing tools. And thank you. you know, <laughs> I think that's a huge issue. Huge. It is. It absolutely is. And I I try to be critical of the ideology as much as I can, and I always get the whole Islamophobia, and I'm like, look, this is what it says, people. And, you know, I'll be the first one to say that there are millions of wonderful Muslim people. They're just bad Muslims because <laughs> they're right. they're. Yeah. They're cherry picking it to the nth degree and coming right. up with what suits their far superior morality. That's not what it says in the book, people. So, yeah, that that whole thing drives me crazy. Yeah, I think Ali Ritzby's sort of cultural, um, yes. being a yes. cultural Muslim uh, yes. is what he's sort of trying to do. He's speaking at West Hill in October. You'll have to come up. Oh, wonderful. Here. Excellent. Um, yeah, he's... <laughs> Yeah. He's a, a friend of mine. We see each other. Kate, not so much with the baby now, but <laughs> but yeah, so, no, he's got drive. some. Yeah, go ahead. Bob. I was just gonna say to drive home a point you were making in the conversations she's had, and I've seen this. She's actually been uh, called an Islamophobe and a Muslim sympathizer within two sentences of each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like wow. on on a on a thread on my Facebook, I had one um, because I was I was saying that harassing a woman for wearing a burkini is wrong, and that's anti-Muslim bigotry. Don't do that shit. And I get this: one, you're being and and yet I was saying, but I don't celebrate the idea of having to wear the damn thing or the hijab or any of that. I don't think it's a good symbol. But, you know, harassing some poor woman that's wearing it is douche, douchebaggery. And one woman said, oh, you're being so terrible and critical about hijabs and you're just as bad as the, the fascists or whatever. And then the next person was like, oh, the Muslims are going to take over your country and then you're going to be, you know, have your head cut off by ISIS. And I was like... <laughs> Do people even read yourselves? <laughs> Seriously. But, but speaking of beheading, the yes. stuff against Armin around yes. the, yes. the public is a frightening issue. It is. So I told I, my congregation that I'm writing a letter to my member of parliament to get them to speak about. Uh-oh, she froze. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, Mr. Bill. Oh no. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get another half hour from her. <laughs> I am. I wonder if her phone died. Uh, I think she's. Sorry, oh, there she is. There you are. Oh, there she is. That's okay. We sent a crash report. Anyways, I'm writing a letter to my member of parliament and sharing it with my congregation so they can send it to their members of parliament because Canada needs to address this. They need to say to Absolutely. Malaysia, this is not okay because Malaysia is going to be another Bangladesh in a very short Absolutely. time where all those people who are in that picture are going to end up being being murdered. Um, Hunted and, down. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a horrifying situation that's when, unfolding there. So. When you have people in the government literally saying we yep. need to hunt these people hunt down, down. Yeah, 
it, yeah. it is insanity. And then every, you know, I, I saw a lot of people saying, "Yeah, where's Reza Aslan now, huh?" Because he yeah. is like, "Oh, Malaysia is so progressive and so moderate." Like, bite me, asshole! <laughs> like, look at this. Look at it. Yeah, it doesn't. It, terrifying. Yeah. It is. It that, is. And the, that overlaps. Yes, sorry. Sorry, Tracy, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to say that that overlaps with what um, Beth was saying earlier about ecumenicism and and what Greta was saying, I think, a little bit about liberal churches is, um, you know, you have the, the Bangladeshis and the Malaysians and the Pakistanis on the one hand where it's the government saying these people have broken the law and, you know, vigilantes should go hunt them down. Um, but then you take Pope Francis, who everybody, for reasons that mystify me, uh, holds up as a liberal who <laughs> sides with ISIS um, uh, over Charlie Hebdo. You know, yeah. who said, yeah, what they did was, you know, it was really terrible to kill those people. But, you know, those people at Charlie Hebdo really should not have committed blasphemy. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you have, yeah. so it's like the, the, the powers of the institutional religion, even if they're, even if all other things being equal, those two religions will fight each other to the death. But they will come together to defend, well, you really shouldn't, but you really shouldn't, you know, the Pope, the Pope will say, you really shouldn't draw cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad because he has a vested interest in people deferring to a religious agenda. Absolutely, because so, if you say- So that's it's right, a, like it's ecumenicism it's sends up a big red flag for me that, it's not necessarily a big hug fest. There's also some calculation and some some motivated self-interest in that. Well, if he says, "Oh, it's okay to go draw Muhammad," and you know, don't you don't have to be respectful of Islam or revere it or any of that, then the person's going to come along. It's like, yeah, you Catholics, giant nest of pedophiles, you know, and and what's he going to say about that? So he's got to hold, hold, hold the line. Oh, well, we're all sacred. So, you know, we, uh, you can't say bad things about any of us, which is, which is you know, he, he should visit my wall once in a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and, it's, and I think there's, that's the interfaith thing that, that was being raised up earlier too, that, um, you know, there's a, a there's that uh, desire to acknowledge and affirm all these different spiritual traditions, right? And the forms of spiritual expression. And the last um, interfaith participation that I had, um, I, I, but I, there are forms of spiritual expression that I find oppressive and, and abhorrent. And everybody just looked at the wall. It was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, no one is supposed to say that, right? And, you know, we were having wow. a conversation about the fact that we couldn't write the word God without an asterisk in the middle because if it got shredded, then, you know, we would be offending our Jewish uh, participants. And that's like uh. Simon Blackburn calls that respect creep, where as soon as I start typing the word God with an asterisk in the middle, um, I'm suddenly kind of affirming their belief system, which I don't agree with. So um, yes. all of that attempt to be so polite and all inclusive that's we don't talk about being inclusive at west hill we talk about being non-exclusive or we talk about being barrier free we will be theologically yes. barrier free we will not be inclusive we are not trying to include everybody's perception so everybody feels you know welcome here we're trying to make it and and i talked on sunday we're trying to i'm hoping that they will become a because of climate change issues a plant-based diet place so that we only offer things that are plant-based, right? And so the first time I said it, I used the word vegan, everybody went crazy. And that's a really challenging <laughs> word. But when I talked about plant-based and barrier-free, like everybody, based foods, right? Not everybody can eat animal products and not everybody, not everybody wants to, right? So we have, we have people who are gluten-free in our church too. And so we will try to bake with gluten-free We'll try it. We try to become barrier free. We're not trying to be inclusive of everything. 
Um, there's a yeah. very, very big difference there. Yeah, no, that's an excellent um, point. Uh, another, another Greta. I don't, I don't know if you, you guys have read Greta Christina, um, yes. but her book "Why Are You Atheists So Angry," which is a fabulous mm -hmm. book. It's a very good book, uh, but she writes really, uh, really well about um, the the problems of ecumenicism, and she she described exactly what you described was that when it comes to um, talking about respecting other forms of spiritual expression you know, it's, it's all hearts and flowers. But then when somebody comes in and asks hard questions, like, how do you know any of this is true? It's, you know, right. yeah, there's, there's the door. The door. <laughs> um, so it's not nearly as accepting as, as it uh, pretends to be. Right. And I think, I think the atheist and secular community has to figure out, and I, and I haven't even really framed this in my own head, but we have to find a way to engage religion about values and about community without getting sidetracked around the belief stuff, right? Right. Yes, always be, there will be people who have to have those conversations and continue picking at that. But the everyday person need to do that. That's exhausting. Don't do that to my heart, right? Let mm -hmm. my heart find something that's going to strengthen me. And, and how can religion help me do that? without all the belief stuff, but with the community stuff, with the, you know, with the, the, you know, humanitarian stuff that you do that I can engage with, with the picnics yeah. with my kids, with the, I don't know, whatever it is, but how, and, let's find a way to separate those things so that we can strengthen with, our communities. And without the, the creed or the statement of yes. faith that says yeah, that. Absolutely. We are we're the, the, the in group and everybody else is the out group exactly. and you've got to conform to be with the in group. That's right. that's right. the biggest failing of religion, I think, in total is that exclusivity of it. But it yeah. it comes from that religious way of thinking that we're special because we've got the right supreme being and we figured out how to read the scripture the right way yeah. and totally. and we're chosen we're and we're so tired of that yeah we're yeah. Just so tired of that it's we just want to be what you say Greta, really, yeah. what you say Greta, really resonates with me um you know as an atheist i would prefer that nobody believe in god evidence uh, an evidence-based worldview all other things being equal an evidence-based worldview is a healthier more productive worldview but that being said um i think right now with the challenges you know particularly in, in the united states but um with the challenges that we're facing right now um they not get so wrapped around the axle about owning theists and and uh, rubbing people's noses and what scripture says and really have that conversation about values, about shared values. Yeah. Because I will I will take a progressive social justice oriented Christian or Muslim as an ally before an atheist who uh, thinks that, uh, you know, Sandy Hook was a false flag. Yeah. Or right. that, yeah. uh, why can't we have a conversation? Why can't we have a rational conversation about a white ethno state? You know, I I'll take, I'll take a compassionate uh, uh, theist over a hateful atheist. And I, and I think right even though I, I don't think we should abandon that conversation, I still think it's an important conversation. But I also think we have to prioritize based on what's the political climate we're living in right now. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's well, urgent. That's now urgent. Yes. Uh oh, we're, we're losing the <laughs> signal. Going to have to I was just going um, to say, yep. Fun. Yeah, if you, uh, thank you, thank you so much for and joining us, Greta. Okay. Sorry, we're losing your, oh no. <laughs> I wanted to get, okay. there she is, there she is. I was going to say thank you so much for joining us. I know it was a bit of a challenge uh, with time and everything, yeah. so we really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate it. you. Thank you.
fitting me and, in to the schedule. Oh, not a problem. And please take a minute please. to tell people where they can uh, find your website, your church's website, and and your book, like this Ooh, one. My book. There's my yes. first book. Um, yes. Uh, my website is my name, Greta Bosper.ca. Uh, my church is westhill.net. Um, and you can find me, uh, Greta Bosper, on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, same thing. So I hope that some of you connect. And I'll pass on some more information about Oasis to you, Deborah, and you can share that yes. with people. Sure. Uh, so Absolutely. That information right. can get us out as well. Okay. Absolutely. Well, right. one of these days, Thank I hope so to make it out that way uh, to Oasis. Maybe it's a little early in the morning okay. for me, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Take care. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's such a unique perspective. You know, I, I and, haven't come across anything quite like that before. It's like I said the, the, while we were talking to her. I I really literally abhor like interface stuff. I know it's needed, but I just have a an issue with it. And I use Matthew Vine as an example, uh, trying to change the church's stance on homosexuality from within the church while well, I applaud his efforts and, you know, more power to him. It just doesn't work. But I, like I said, the Greta, I think her perspective and how she's approaching it is, is so much more, I, I don't like to use the term progressive, but it's, it's much more, maybe active is a better word. Uh, there, there's a, it's not just words. She's actually doing what, you know, has to be done and, and, and going out and promoting that type of thing. And it's just, it's a yeah. more realistic, that's the word I'm looking for, a way of approaching yeah. it. Well, yeah, and like she said, you know, keeping the the structure there, but divesting the language that causes the problems is, I think, a really good way of looking at it and i think like you said it's realistic because it's it's going to be a lot easier to get people to buy into well the the structure of everything is here we're just going to talk about it a little differently and and yeah well i yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to remember who is, uh, I read it recently i'm sure many people have said something similar but i i read somebody it might have been friendly atheist or somebody like that recently who said that um you know if the atheist community thinks that people are just going to give up their religion or going to give up church without replacing it with something, something else yes. that, that that's just not going to happen that that you know as Greta said that fills a human need for yeah. community and you know social contact and all of that stuff um so I, I think she's definitely on the right track with just sort of you know nudging the conversation in a in a different direction yeah well I, I think she makes a good point is there's probably a lot more clergy well, we know there are out there that think the same way she does. And I think one of the biggest issues for me when I came out as an atheist is losing that social structure. And for those that know me now know I'm basically a homebody. I'm agoraphobic. I don't, I mean, part of that is due to my illness, but it's also because I'm in such an isolated, you know, uh, area that there, I, you know, I don't have, like, Deb has many uh, social events that she can go to. I do yeah. not. If we had one within, an, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes, I might be able to find a ride. Probably once I got there, I would be. But I think for, you know, for people like me that are in socially isolated areas, people cling on to the church because of that social aspect of it. I mean, I only know of one other out atheist besides myself in the area that I live in. Just one out of 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I know of two that are, but they're 
not outspoken talking to me about God or whatever, I'll say, well, I don't believe that way. I think it's bullshit. These people will not say that. So it, it's there, there, there is a gap that needs to be filled. And I, I you know, and I, yeah. you know, <clears throat> somewhere in there it has to be. And I, I think what well, Tracy said is true. People are not going to leave the church if there's nothing to fill that gap. Absolutely. I mean, I was lucky, I guess, in that the whole church experience never held any particular value to me. So I never missed it. But yeah. people who have been in, and that's something when I read Seth Andrews book, because he was, you know, Mr. Church guy, you know, he, he did the, the, uh, Christian radio. He was talking to Christian musicians all the time and everything kind of revolved around his faith. And that was one thing he talked about was like, well, now what do I do? Like, I know it's exactly. all bullshit, but, but I've lot, you know, I don't have my church. I don't have the same kind of connection to my job anymore. Like what, what do I have left? And it's, it's a real issue for people. And that's why I envy people like Tracy who never had to deal with this bullshit to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. like, okay, yeah, I made it 28, 28 <laughs> years or so of my life. I mean, I, I, I mean, and when I go home and visit my dad, if I go home on a Sunday, which I try to avoid for just this reason, so I don't have to go to church. Um, yeah. But I'm, you know, still friends with. I mean, Christ, I was raised in that church. These people are like my parents. I mean, I know, or I knew when I was younger, I could call any of them and say, hey, I'm stranded here. I can't get a hold of dad or mom. Can you come pick me up? They'd come pick me up. You know, that, I mean, while I do miss that, I don't in some regards because not only were they good for that, they were very good for tattling as well. <laughs> but... You know, I mean, I know when I go home to my dad's church, I don't really have any worries except from the minister. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, and it's sad, you know, for people like me in living in a rural situation that doesn't have the activities of a city or a larger town, you know, that don't have, you know, as I said, there's two of us. <laughs> and, you know, we're on opposite ends of the town. She, you know, works their shift, yada, yada. I mean, we just don't connect. Plus, our views on other things are totally different. But it's, it's, yeah. it's, very, it's very hard. It's, it's, uh, it can be lonely sometimes. No, I totally get that. And, and it's funny because now I was raised you know, kind of an only kid till I was like six and I got used to sort of entertaining myself. So I didn't, when I was like, oh, I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't know any atheists. Oh, well. And I just kind of carried on because I, again, up here, it was a non-issue. Yeah. And I, I left for school and I was away from home. I left all my high school friends i broke up with my boyfriend everything was new so it just kind of all the timing was perfect right it just yeah i never had to worry well, about missing anything yeah. well and, and, and i should repeat i i don't regret the life i have i'm doing exactly what i want to do that i could not do when i i mean i'm single and i fucking love it i don't have to worry about you know, um, diva responsibilities of taking care of a house. Um, not that I didn't love my partners at the time, but it came, you know, I was working two jobs, doing laundry, doing cooking, taking it. Yeah, I don't do any of that now. Okay, well, I do, but not to that extent. Yeah. <laughs> I better clarify laundry? that. I better clarify that because someone will take me literally. But I, you know, so it's like, and it's the funny thing because I get a lot of people, what do you do for fun? I'm like, my blog. And they're like, you research the do. fuck out of stuff. And, and yeah. For me, I mean, it, it works out nice being that I am agoraphobic and do not like leaving my my apartment, much to the chagrin of a couple of my friends who try various means to get me out of the house. But that's what I enjoyed. I enjoy doing. I like, you know, uh, 
my <laughs> air quotes. You know, I like doing what I do. I'm doing what I think I can do based on the situation I am in. And I think that's what it, what's important. Someone had posted the other day, who shall remain nameless, um, that they didn't feel like they were doing enough within the community. And it's like, you do what you are able to do. Yeah. If it means... You know, if it means writing what you're feeling, I mean, uh, there, there's a couple of people within our community who have been very open about, okay, I'm going to use Callie as an example. She has been hugely, well, Callie and Celeste, have been hugely influential in sharing their experience of going through SRS surgery. I mm -hmm. know it. You know, I have the, the you know, I kind of know what goes on with it, but to actually read her experiences has greatly influenced, you know, my knowledge. I, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not just book knowledge anymore. I can actually say, and I, I know somebody that has gone through it. I'm pretty sure yeah. some of my friends have, and I just don't know it. But, you know, just those little things, uh, you know, Tracy sharing about secular parenting or, you know, yeah. Stuff like that, in the long run, I think, helps, you know, in the way you can. I mean, I know some podcasters have been rethinking their, whether they want to continue or take a break. And, you know, just that one comment from a reader changes their mind. My goal has always been, even with my blog, you know, if one person's mind is changed or influenced or helped by something I write or talk about, so be it. My job is done. Yep, absolutely. Um, do you guys have any more comments about stuff you want to go to? Because I know Tracy's looking kind of tired and I Sorry. actually am no, 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 it's fine. I actually am trying to leave to go to New York State at like 8 o'clock in the morning, which is ridiculous for me. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we, we may rent, wind things up a little early, but if there was anything else we wanted to discuss before the end of the night, we should do that. I, I, no, I'm we, just we... going to put it out there that I, I think Greta gave me some really good advice. And I may actually uh, reach out to the pastor of that Unitarian church yeah. and say, what, you know, what would it look like to have this also serve the secular community and uh, maybe have that conversation? So yeah. I will. No. will uh, Excellent. I've, I've been to, to you. Uh, on that. I've been to a, a Unity Church, which is different than a Unitarian Church. The Unity Church is a lot more woo-woo. Yeah, I yeah, don't want that either. They've yeah, got, I, I'm trying to, it's like a Universalist or a Unitarian, or are they the same yeah. thing? I don't really know. It's, Uni I just know it's a, you get yeah. a U in it. Yeah, Unity is definitely different, and they, they do things like teach chakras and Sunday school. I, I think a lot school, of it depends man, no, on. No, I, I would definitely not go to that. They, yeah, they they hold Reiki seminars and things like that. I yeah, I mean, you might you, then you might as well go to mass. Yeah, I think, go I think to it mass depends if they're going to spoon feed you church, like though. total utter you know superstition. That yeah, I don't have Beth, any I think, in that either. Beth was trying to say, I think it depends on who's Sorry. running the show. <laughs> it's the lag. It's the lag. <laughs> Well, I, I know some of uh, universal uh, Unitarian churches, and I think Universalist is different, that are very woo-oriented, but that's because, you know, as the, uh, the minister put it, I'm spiritual and not religious. And then I've also been to some that are much more secular-oriented, so I think it really depends right. on how... And then there one church I, I did attend... Um, was one week it was one way, one week it was this way. It, it, they, you know, they didn't stay focused on just one specific spiritual leaning, right. for lack of a better word. So I think it all depends. 
I imagine it does, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it just uh <laughs> Oh the snorty dog. <laughs> Tracy just popped out for a minute. She says, "Sorry, that was the dog at the door." Snorry. Yeah, I was. I, 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 I told. I told Rachel, my my daughter, to tap on the door when it's time to give her a kiss good night, and I just heard. Oh, it was the tap at the door. <laughs> it was the dog. <laughs> uh, I guess okay. she wanted a kiss good night too. <laughs> No worries, no worries. <laughs> but, but that's cool that you might that you might do that. I I, I wish yeah. I could do something like that around here, but because of the influence of the one church, and it leans very heavily uh, charismatic Pentecostal, and it seems that the other churches seem to toe the line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I might, I would probably have better luck, actually, and this is going to sound bizarre, going to the Catholic Church. Wow. <laughs> I would, and talk, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I happen to know the minister, well, the, the, the priest there, and, priest. and he's pretty fair, you know, he's fairly progressive, but as I said, you know, right now with, with the climate here, I wouldn't even feel safe doing that. Yeah. I mean, I, do I feel like my life's being threatened? No, but I wouldn't want to go around any more than it already has been. Oh, fair enough. By the way, I was uh, I was seeing reports today that some of the uh, Nazi folks have started to lose their jobs. This is this is good. Yeah. <laughs> The the only thing I, I I will say about that because I don't want to really want to, is that I I've seen some people saying that they're they're being doxxed. First and foremost, doxing involves publishing unpublished information. So if they are on Facebook, for example, or they have a blog like I do. Any information you put out there is public information. Now, if your cell phone is unpublished, nobody has access to that cell phone, and they publish that cell phone yeah. number, that's doxing. But yeah, or if you if you don't have, yeah, if you don't put your mm -hmm. place of employment on your Facebook and somebody goes and figures it out, that's different. But if it's right fucking there. For everybody to see where you work um first of all why would you ever do that and second of all well you're fucked then <laughs> like for me i mean i just have that uh, you know i'm employed yeah um, people are gonna figure out really damn quick where i work okay yeah there's like three restaurants in town <laughs> it's not gonna be <laughs> hard to buy processes of learning but yeah, doxing is the publishing of unpublished information. If it's yeah. on the web, it is public knowledge. If it can be found on the web through public records, it is public information. So, so it's just if, what you, if you don't want to lose your job, then don't publish where you work and run around in Nazi uh, uh, rallies with, well, with your like face uncovered. <laughs> It's like I tell people that are concerned for security reasons, uh, especially within the anti-vax and some of the atheist groups that are being shut down. You can lock down your profile. Hopefully I've done mine right, where I have gotten rid of every picture that is not of me. Okay, there's one picture that is of me and Deb. Deb and I are both on the net, so we're not too worried about it. But I took all my family pictures off. Not that I had that many. I don't have my place of employment listed just because, well, you're going to figure it out anyways. But, yeah, any information I don't want out there. I don't have my phone number connected to my Twitter or to my Facebook. Reason being, once I do that, it's now in a public database that can be hacked. You know, it, it, you got you know, if you're worried about your safety, and I'm talking genuinely worried about your safety, don't make it easy for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And apparently these guys didn't know how to do that. Well, I think they just assume, and this goes back to something you and I were talking about beforehand with the First Amendment, 
is that the First Amendment deals with government repercussions, whether it's state, federal, local, regional, whatever. It does not mean that you can say whatever the fuck you want, which you can, does not mean that you will not suffer consequences for those actions. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is uh, okay, something... Flips... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it, do, it then slips into the, the moral versus the legal, then you have a decision to make. But if you say something, it does not protect you from the consequences of what you say. There are speaking caveats, of, of course. And speaking of more con uh, consequences, so uh, the Daily Stormer, which is one of those racist websites, yes. they posted this absolutely horrific screed just you know, trashing the poor woman who was killed, basically saying she deserved to die anyway, so who cares? And according to this, um, as of yesterday, because they were hosted on GoDaddy, GoDaddy tweeted, we informed the Daily Stormer they have 24 hours to move the domain to another provider as they violated our terms of service. So... Oh, yeah, that was about their, uh, not their site, but it was their domain name. Right. Oh, so, yeah. So Daddy said, we, is violation of terms of service, so you can either move the domain name or use it. So they moved it to Google. Oh. Was the last they, time. Try, they tried to move it to Google. Google, oh. I believe. If and uh, I only briefly saw this article just before the show, I think Google denied them as well. Oh, then that'd be nice. But, uh, I am not a hundred percent. I am not a hundred percent positive, but there was something that came out, and I saw it just before we went live that uh, they tried to move to Google, and Google said no. Nah. Yeah. And, and the, these are the consequences of your speech. These are not protected by the First Amendment rights. And the ge yeah. the gentleman that lost his job. Most likely, even though it was a minor corporation, a hot dog stand, um, most likely have a morals clause in their, their corporate policies, and he violated, just like Phil Robertson did with A&E. A&E well, is not a government entity. E even if they didn't have that, if the guy yeah. is a PR nightmare, then yep. they yeah. have every right to terminate that employee. Yeah. You know they don't yeah. want to be they don't want to be associated with Nazis. Well, fair well, enough. Okay, there there's yeah. a meme going around from Tiki Torch. Okay, you know the the lantern thing. <laughs> no, they put out a statement. That yep. we're not associated. With, and someone goes, I can't believe that Tiki Torch has to even state that. But but these good are on them for doing it. Yes. I mean, these are consequences of your actions. These are not protected. Yes, there are caveats, and I'm going to put this out there because I know somebody will bring it up. Unless you are a protected class. Being a Nazi class. Yeah. Being no. black, well, even if, even if you're a protected class, if you're doing something that is legitimate grounds for termination, you can still be terminated. You can be a 55 year old black lesbian and still be, you know, just, you know, uh, terminated. And I say, I, I suppose that as soon as I said it, I know there are some places where uh, being, a, being a LGBT is not a protected status. The, the corporation that I worked for in my history uh, considered it to be such. So from a and, HR and, and, being very cautious standpoint. Yeah. So, um, but uh, if, if, even if you are in, even if you're in five protected classes, if you are damaging the corporate brand, then yeah. your ass is going to get fired. Absolutely. Yeah. There are caveats, obviously, and we could spend hours going through all the different if scenarios, but it comes down to if it's not a government entity, and this explains to some degree why the police response to some seem to be slow. Because they are a government entity, if they intercede too soon, they could be held responsible under the First Amendment. But if they respond too slow, which in some instances they may have, 
it, it's a quagmire. So, it, it, but yeah, private private individuals corporations not protected by by the First Amendment free speech clause. As I said, it gets into a moral moral quagmire, and, and so you know, no, no, these people are not being doxxed unless unless this guy is or individual or whoever is publishing it is publishing private information. But from what I understand, he is or she. I don't even know if it's there male. on your Twitter profile. This is the town I live in, and this is the company I work at. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, Sorry, I, I, I do. I. I've you don't want to get fired for being a Nazi, then maybe don't be a Nazi. That's right. Yeah, well, well, it's it, it's so funny because I I've been posting some memes of some of the pundits and pals who are basically supporting Trump, for lack of a better word, and it's just like they're trying to say, well, he's really not a Nazi, and, and well, I I hate racism, you know what happened, blah blah blah. It's like um. I, I so wanted, I wanted to, but it changed. I wanted to just put on my memes, Nazi. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you're supporting his ideology. You're a fucking Nazi. But I, I love, know. I love it when people say there are no Nazis. There haven't been any Nazis since 1945. You know, they're, the old, the uh, Nazis were uh, like, dude, <laughs> really? What do you call like the, the guy? Dic look, dictionary definition says, or people who think like that, you know, it's or, like. Or what do you call the guy who's wearing the replica SS uniform with the giant swastika flag, giving Hitler salutes to Trump? What do you call that? Yeah, right. He's a he's I, I a white identitarian. He's not a Nazi. Yeah. He's just a identitarian. Oh, nice. Yeah, I just find it bizarre because I've had a couple of people say, well, you don't have any right to be upset about this. And I'm like, um, yeah, please. Every and decent I, I human was, being should be upset about this. Well, yeah. I, I said, I, I said, besides the fucking obvious that, you know, I'm human, um, I have family, well, past family, dead now, that are survivors of the original fucking Nazi idiot. I have friends whose entire family, other than their parents, are gone because they were Hungarian uh, gypsies. She has one uncle. That's it, besides her mom and dad. The rest of her family is gone. Yeah, I have every single right to be upset about it, and besides the fact that I'm human. It's like, <laughs> the, the justifications people are giving the, to support this is just, it's mind-boggling. Oh, it is. It's like, it's it's crazy. And I'm sorry. Anytime I hear somebody who's like, you know, whites are being persecuted, I want to slap him across the face with my white old hand here. <laughs> <laughs> like, fucking hell, really? Like, ugh. Slap them over the head with... Yeah, it's, it's, it's the whole, you know, it's just like, you know, white, you know, white grievance and male grievance and Christian grievance. It's like, uh, you know, when Christians say they're persecuted, what they mean is the only holiday that anybody acknowledged. And now we can't pretend that we're not the only ones. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, that's what it is. It's now we have to acknowledge that other people exist. Yeah. Well, good. And that's what is persecution. Well, I think a lot of it, that, that mindset was really exemplified by uh, Fierstein today when he said, you know, it's the KKK Christian. And it's like, um, uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> it was founded uh, as a Christian organization. And, and I was telling Deb the other day, it's just like this whole, and, and I'm, I'm using this as a very broad um, tell, uh, umbrella term, this whole Christian identity movement. It's called Christian identity for a reason, because it, their justification for their actions is, in according Jesus. to their inter interpretation, Jesus. biblical. Is biblical. It goes yep. back to you can take it back to the serpent seed doctrine. Basically, for those that don't know, Satan fucked Eve and had Cain. Okay, that's one aspect. Or it goes back to mm -hmm. uh, the curse of Ham and uh, Noah's flood. So allegedly, according to some proponents, not all of them believe this, 
that Ham's wife was of unpure blood, hence why the mayhem and chaos ensued again after the flood. This is rooted in their ideology when they were founded in all your Christian identity movements. And we're seeing a proli pro proliferation of this as, as time progresses, and it's gotten worse in the last 10 to 20 years. Well, hopefully somebody will see reason in soon, because it's fucking crazy. But uh, I think it's about I time to call screaming. it. I'd oh, like to win yes. the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you and me both. I'm not playing it might uh, help. <laughs> oh, well. On that note, I think we will uh, call it an evening. So, uh, Beth, uh, where can we find you? Easiest way is on Twitter, Dune Triple Nine Eight, and I've actually been more active on Twitter lately. <laughs> I don't Ooh. know why, but... Yeah, I've been posting shit, but... Um, that connects to both Facebook, which is Beth A. Hambridge, and my blog, Havoc and Chaos. And I'm trying to finish up a couple postings, but I keep being interrupted by world, world events. So mm -hmm. we shall see. But yeah, and I can also be found on Google under Beth A. Hambridge as well. Awesome. Although I'm not very active. Keep being inter interrupted by your cat. That's what I thought she was going to say. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, a, he's actually been pretty, and he's gotten huge, by the way. Yeah, I, I grab, excuse me, grab him, but he's hiding. He, he's, he no longer fits in the hand or the drawer. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Be a, yeah, it's hard to believe he's almost, uh, almost, well, he'll be about three and a half months, I think, this week. Yeah. Oh. Wow. So, Tracy, where can we find you? I am on Facebook, uh, Godless Mama, and I'm on Twitter, at The Godless Mama, and my blog is godlessmama.com, and Miss Morgan and I are also on Facebook as The Political Feminist. Yay. And if anybody's wondering, Morgan's still on vacation, so she'll be back next week. She's traveling around somewhere. I don't even know where, but that's okay. <laughs> out of, has to out of uh, the deep south, which I is was going to say, so. I'm hoping yeah. away, away from Mississippi. I'm hoping. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm headed off to uh, New York State tomorrow, and uh, I'm going to hit Niagara. I've never seen Niagara Falls from your side, ever. So this will be interesting. I'm going to go see Niagara Falls from your side. We have... I'm sorry, but we always said it was the ugly side. <laughs> so I, I, I may have to eat my words if I'm over there in person, but we'll see. <laughs> well, to be, be <laughs> honest, Tracy's I've seen it from laughing. both What's sides, that, and they look the same. I've seen it from both sides, and they look the same, but that was 25 years ago, so okay. I've never seen it. Girl, you need to get up here. I've never been. I know. I need to. I've, I've been. I've said just the other day that I want to take the kid to see it. You got to see the falls. But honestly, now I may change my tune after this week because I, I don't know what's over on your side. But we got some really cool shit on our side. You can actually go under like behind the falls. There's a tunnel back yeah. there and stuff. So that's cool. Cave of the, yeah. cave of the wind. Yep. Been there twice. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, once once That's, in like ni 1982. I actually remember that. I think but, that's uh, the yeah, it looks I like went. I'm. It looks like I'm gonna do the Maid of the Mist from the side, from your side. So it'll be fun, and and then um, if everything worked out, I'll be headed to Animal Adventure Park on Thursday, and I'll be meeting the famous April the Giraffe and her little giraffe. So that'll that'll be fun, because uh, Beth and I watched the the giraffe get born at the other. So it'll be fun to actually see the not so little guy. I think when he was born, he was five foot nine. I think he's like eight or nine feet now, and that's since April. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think he's over eight, eight feet now. They're not picking him up to go on the scale no more. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, that was yeah. definitely interesting. 
It was. It was. I kind of felt sorry for the little guy having to fall six feet from, yeah. like, the get-go, but I guess that's how they, they kind of stun themselves awake. And, ooh, that, that hurt. Ow. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and everything goes well. I should be uh, seeing uh, Shujin and Tiny, so that'll be fun. But I will, of course, um, this week I won't be on Holy Crap because I'll be camping. I'm going heathen camping on the weekend, so that'll be fun too. Um, but uh, Holy Crap, the broadcast does go on Sundays at 12.05 a.m. Eastern. Uh, on You can find it at holycraptheblogcast.com. They have a YouTube channel by the same name. So you can find uh, not me this week, but you can find the rest of the, the crap crew over there. Um, yeah, I think that's it because I'm, I'm going to be away most of this week, so I'm not going to be doing much in the way of hangouts and things. But uh, there is a, a lot going on always at the Great Debate Community, which is over on Google Plus under the Great Debate Community. And there's uh, Steve McRae's channel and the Great Debate Community Public Access channel. They just did another Kent Hoven King Crocoduck debate the other night. So uh, if that interests you, I definitely recommend popping over there for that. And uh, there's lots of interesting discussions going on too. So, and as usual, we like to talk about the uh, Taylor Scholarship over at the Whitefields Education Foundation. That's uh, providing counseling for people who are leaving or have left religion and feel like they want to uh, talk to somebody about that. And they have the Taylor Scholarship, which provides funding for people who want to talk to somebody that may not have the funds to do so. And that's found over at whitefieldseducational.org forward slash my Book of Mormon podcast because the scholarship was founded by David Michael, formerly of my Book of Mormon podcast. So there's that. And we do have a Patreon if you uh, feel like throwing us a buck or two, that would be great. We do use that to pay for our speaker hosting. And uh, that is actually going to be going up on us in the next month. So uh, any little bit there can help. And we do appreciate those of you who do uh, sponsor us every, every show. So uh, with that, I think I will uh, leave us till next week. And oh, and next week is Eclipse Day. Uh, so make sure you get your eclipse glasses or number 14 or higher welding glasses if you're going to look at it because uh, it could hurt your corneas. So don't don't stare at it with sunglasses on, please. That's just not going to work. But um, if everything goes according to plan, we should have Professor Stephen here with us and we are going to talk about solar eclipses. So that'll be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. I hope that I'll I will have seen something. We, we're supposed to get about 70% coverage here. So I'm hoping I will have been able to see something earlier in the day to, to talk about or maybe share a, a picture or two. But uh, the good professor should be here and we're going to talk about solar eclipses. So that'll be next week. And we'll see everybody then. And until then, I will leave you with uh, Dave Foda's Only Creed for Humankind. And we'll see you next week. I know the truth and power of reason and of rational thinking, and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself, and of expanding my intellectual boundaries, and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance, and I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision and of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny, be it intellectual, emotional, or philosophical, and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. 
and know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies. And I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry, and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious, and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. And I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.